This is episode 45 of The Living Reminders with Mary and Blake. The sudden departure was you. Uh huh? Why? Because I could. We're going to have to do better than that. No, I doubt. You do. Why? Because there has to be a reason. Why? Everything in my life I've done for a reason. Why? To help people, to, to guide them, to ease their suffering, even though I've suffered myself. I sacrificed my happiness. I let my family abandon me. Why? For you! <laughs> Everything you've done, you've done because you thought I was watching you. Because you thought I was judging you. But I wasn't. I'm not. You've never done anything for me. You did it for yourself. From Cranston, Rhode Island, welcome to The Living Reminders. It's a podcast dedicated to the show The Leftovers on HBO. We're still here, and so are you. So let's talk about it's a mad, 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 mad world. Hey everyone, welcome. I'm your host, Mary Larson. My name's Blake, and I never thought I would see an episode of television focused on a lion sex cult. But I'm glad I have now. Okay. I'm glad I've got it. All I'm right. Gonna, you know what? Off the bucket list. Yeah, there you go. Off the bucket list. Who knew it was on it? <laughs> That was interesting. That was an interesting, interesting episode. You know what? We're going to have to postpone this for one second because I forgot one thing. To record? Yes, I forgot to record. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> you guys get to hear that little bit again of... No, no, no. No, no. We can just do a post. We oh, don't have to... Never mind. You just get to wait around. So uh, you're just watching in Facebook Live right now. Blake's going to hit record. That episode was bananas. We are recording, so give me one... Give me two seconds of silence. Okay, good. There I am. I'm back. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was so amazing. If you liked it, uh, feel free to share this on your Facebook wall. Um, make sure to use those little, like, emojis that come across the screen. That helps us out tremendously. Much love to you guys. All right, so you want me just to say, hi, I'm your host, Mary Larson. Uh, no, you don't even have to do any of that. I don't have to do any of that. Okay, cool. No, because we're going to do that post. Never mind. It means I am going to have to do it. All right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that episode. Uh, bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S. Yes. I, I, I'm, I was waiting for you to do that, and I, and I had my finger on on the button. On what? On the Maryism button. That's Ho Gwen Stefani. Hoping that you wouldn't hoping that you wouldn't say it correctly. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, the episode was something else. What would your Damon rating be out of one out of five Damons? Oh, well, you, um, all right. I'm going to give this one 4.4 Damons. And the reason why I'm giving it 4.4 Damons is I liked it better than the Kevin Sr. episode. I was a little harsh on that episode. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but I liked it better than that. But I did not like it better than Nora's episode, and I did not like it better than the premiere, and those okay. were 4.5s for me, and it was not a five Damon episode in my opinion, so it has to go in the 4.4 range. See, I, I, I set the uh, I set the uh, the, the level, and, and now I got to stick by it. You know, I, I, it's my take. I got to stick by the take, and the reason why it's 4.4 is because it's a fine episode unto itself. It's brilliant. It's wonderfully written, wonderfully directed, mm -hmm. uh, but I felt like it was uh, like a vignette almost okay um or in the music terms it would be a concerto you know it would just a, a mini concerto unto itself i love how you need to use the consonants when you say concerto <laughs> wait concerto all right how's that sound more like you <laughs> it's a concerto 
Uh, and the reason why that is the way that it is, it's because it's a separate story unto itself. And it, it does fit within the framework of the uh, season that we have so far. It makes sense. You have to you have to find out how they get to Australia, what happens. And it is a great story for Matt itself. It caps off what I think is a, uh, a mini play for Matt uh, for the entire three seasons mm -hmm. of The Leftovers. It shows his journey, his personal journey. We'll get into that later. But coming off of episode four, which was five daemons for me. Yes. Like we had, the momentum was there. We were like, boom, we, we're in it. And now we're ready to, we are ready to get this world going. And then we're on a boat with a, a lion sex club. <laughs> um, and while it's great and I loved watching it, I just felt like, I felt like a little bit of a deflation. Oh. Do you know what I mean? A, a deflation in the daemons I mean, a deflation in the <laughs> in, in the daemons yes but a deflation in the season okay and that's why it is 4.4 again good episode very good episode i think just in in the grand scheme it felt like okay we're coming off of this wonderful five daemon episode and now pff, okay All here right. we go. so how about you my darling what are you giving it i'm giving it a five five it's daemons. the fifth episode i'm giving it a five because it took me on a wild ride that i never knew i was ever going to see mm -hmm. ever now i can't unsee <laughs> all those things that i saw like last a lion night sex cult yeah, that was, holy smokes, interesting. <laughs> um, so, you know, I I'm giving it a five. I loved the music. It was really odd, different music that they were able to use. Like, you know, this is just, the writers just, and, and whoever is choosing this music, they're just having so much fun right. leaving these extra Easter eggs to be like, here, what do you think this is going to mean? Are you going to Google what this song was? Are you going to yeah. learn more about it? Because <laughs> they drop so much in other different ways. So, yeah, I'm giving it a five. I'm probably going to be giving it fives here and out. I think that we needed a break after the intensity of plot that happened last week. Remember, this is like right when the uh, roller coaster has reached its peak. Right. Yep. And now we're going to start looking down. OK, and now is when it starts to pick up speed and it's going to keep rolling. So I think we needed a little weird break. OK, you know what? That actually makes sense to me because, you know, episode four was like, OK, we are at the top. And you know how at the top you have that one moment of like respite and you can see the bottom and you know what's coming. Yeah. But you have that one little moment of like it's a Ugh. pause almost. It's like your your whole body pauses. OK. All right. And with that said, episode five is that pause. It's that. Yes. Okay. All right. They're on the way to Australia. It's going downhill from here. What it, it? I mean, things get strange. You know what was funny is we we were corrected last week for calling it Melbourne, that people actually in Australia call it Melbourne. Yep. And everyone today or on, on last night's episode, they called it Melbourne. <laughs> so maybe that's just how us Americans say it. And we all say like Melbourne. Said, I'm from Boston. I say things how I want to say them. That's just how it goes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like Conchetto. <laughs> oh, my God. God bless you. All right. So our friend on Facebook, Christina Brown, says that she absolutely loved it. Kept her eyes glued to the screen, seeing that David Burton is the guy on the bridge and the karaoke MC. Just few the, further fuels my choice that this is all a spiritual journey for these people. She gives it 4.75. And hold on. I'm going to pause. For all of you who are like, oh, hold up. My brain. What? David Burton? We're going to recap. Okay. <laughs> uh, Christina gives it 4.75 Damon's. 4.5 for the story, and she deducted uh, 2.25 uh, for the lack of Kevin Jr., but added 0.25 for the naked <laughs> running man. I love the breakdown. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Sean Mullins on Facebook says, I would give the entire episode 3.5 Damons, but the ending, 11 Damons. That ending. That's like, that's serious. Freaking, that's almost yeah. 108 Damon territory, and that's <laughs> that's saying something. That's the guy I was telling you about. Oh, my God, I laughed so friggin' hard. So three years ago, this guy is rock climbing in Perth and dies then comes back to life in a cave. Did this happen the same time that Kevin died and Senior was in Perth? Perhaps that's why he was there with Kevin as the karaoke host and the man on the bridge. So many connections that have not been connected yet. Yep. I'm feeling it. Angie Graves Lee uh, on Facebook says, I will freely admit that my, the Matt uh, that Matt is the main character I am least invested in on this show. 
So maybe that's why this episode left me cold. He finally seemed to accept that his faith doesn't keep him immune from bad things in life, and that is fine. But with only four episodes left, it's way too much time devoted to him. Even the, hey, look, it's the bridge karaoke guy, didn't redeem it for me. So two whole Damons. Um, don't you worry. It's coming <laughs> back, my friend. It's coming back. Yay! Let's play Figure Out That Title. All right, Marvin. This is your segment. This at, is your time to shine. This, this was first, a hard one. At first, I thought I was going to be, ooh, baby, baby, it's a wild world. And then I was like, <laughs> they added, like, four mats. So, okay, it's a bad world. It's a mad world. I'm feeling mad because it's close to Matt. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I had no clue. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. I'm very proud of you for admitting that. Oh, I always admit my faults. Good job. Well, I will tell you that there is logic behind this title. There always is. And back in 1963, there was a movie called It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And essentially, it was a comedy after a long prison sentence. This guy, Smiler Grogan, he was headed at high speed. His name speed. was Smiler? His name was Smiler. And has a bunch of famous people and whatever. And he was heading at high speed to a California park where he hid $350,000 from a job, uh, a bank heist that he did 15 years previ- previously. But he accidentally careens over a cliff in view of four cars who, whose occupants go down to help. And the dying Grogan gives details of where the money is buried. And when the witnesses fail to agree on sharing cash, a crazy chase develops across the state. Oh. And one of the main characters... At the end of the film, he loses everything. And he's like, there are all the people that were chasing the money ended up in the hospital at the end. So a spoiler alert. And none of them had the money because the money was eventually lost. It fell and it went to the wind, you know, like mm-hmm. they, they let go of it. And he thinks my whole life is over. He loses everything. He loses his wife. His, he loses his daughter. He loses his job. He loses oh everything. He's like, sounds like someone else I know I named Matt. I know. And at the end, he says, I don't know if there's anything that's going to make me laugh ever again, because technically this movie was a comedy. Oh. And uh, one of the nurses and the people that were busting his balls the whole movie slips on a banana peel. And then everybody laughs, oh. and even including him. So it's like it's a test of faith in, in what what comes out of life. And so there is technically a reason for this There always title. is a reason for yes, their Yes, there title. is, and that is that. So it was a movie. Yes. You ready to reheat those leftovers? Yes, I am. All right, let's do it. It's time to reheat the leftovers. All right, the details on this one. It was written by Lila Biok, or Biok, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And if you're listening, Lila, I apologize please correct me if i'm wrong and of course it was written by one damon lindelof himself and lila has written uh, a couple of episodes of that show manhattan and also was a story editor on don't be ridiculous and the book of kevin now i know i know all of you amazing people like again last episode we established i couldn't say nerds anymore so i'm going to say amazing that was that was your suggestion a lot of you amazing people out there amazing. are going to be asking, well, what the heck is a story editor? What, what does a story editor do? And like last episode, we talked about teleplay and the difference between teleplay and writing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the story editor is a job title in motion and pictures and television production. Uh, it's also sometimes called the supervising producer. And a story editor is a member of the screenwriting staff who edits stories for screenplays. The story editor, although, has many responsibilities, including finding new script breakdown writers, developing stories with writers, and ensuring that scripts are suitable for production. So, like, how big of a deal are they in the in the writer's room? Well, um, are they kind of like the leader, like the captain? They're what they're they're there. They're there to like for the writers to bounce ideas off. And to help like explore those ideas, make them bigger, make them grander, or make them smaller, and uh, get to get to the point of the story. So they're like their TA. You know, I'm going to help you reach your full potential. Right. <laughs> so that's that. Uh, it was directed by Nicole Castle, who is uh, who has directed uh, many great shows, uh, including The Americans. Love uh, that show. Love The Americans. Better Call Saul, also great. The Killing. 
uh, the following, which was actually not that. It was a, actually kind of a terrible show with uh, Kevin Bacon. Well, just, and oh, God, Fearful, yes. You remember that show? Yes. Rectify, uh, another bad show, Vinyl. Uh, and also directed another episode of The Leftovers. You want to know what it was? Which one? No Room at the Inn. It was oh. Matt's second Matt-centric She's episode. a Matt, Matt person. She has Matt's number, I suppose. And the song was uh, – this actually – this was uh, a traditional Hebrew prayer of uh, the Ashri or the Ashray. I apologize if I get that wrong, which is about the justness and fairness of God. It was by a guy named Benzian Miller. And the Ashray is about three concepts. And so this is the opening song, how which, they're changing it every single episode right. to like the magical, sparkly people dis- disappearing. So you're led to believe, because you heard that pinging from the submarine throughout the whole prayer. Yes. You're led to believe that this was the French guy who, was, who did the whole yoga, naked yoga thing. That toe. Praying. Was so strong. <laughs> Watch out for that toe. It can, it can break your neck. And essentially the, the concepts are, number one, People are happy when they're close to God. Number two, God cares about the poor and the oppressed. And three, God rewards good behavior and punishes evil. Okay. Uh, so that's that. All right. That, those are the details there, kiddo. Okay. So this episode was crazy. <laughs> Talking about toe yoga right there. The, okay. The F's account the leftovers had. Like, I know we said this for the Nora episode. Mm-hmm. But the F's account that this that the leftovers has is is far beyond overdraft now. It's like they they're just like we're gonna do whatever the hell we want. Yeah, we're we're on HBO and this is our final season, so we don't care who we offend or shock. We're just gonna go there, and that's what they did. And, and now we it. have to talk about it. So we're gonna be very careful because we're on Facebook. Live. So let's just talk about how crazy this episode was. Okay, so uh, there was this guy, Sean Collins on Vulture. Yes. And uh, he wrote pretty much like the most amazing little paragraph. So I'm going to read it as if I was Sean. He said, uh, okay, so here it goes. On this week's episode of The Leftovers, a French naval officer strips naked, blasts old music to a full volume to attract the attention of his captain, murders the man, steals his nuclear launch key, seals himself in the missile launch control room of the submarine, and then fires a nuke at an uninhibited island in the South Pacific. So that's all what happened in the midst of naked yoga with very strong toes. <laughs> okay, with commercial flights grounded following the explosion, a quartet of our heroes led by Reverend Matthew Jameson board a relief plane and head to Tasmania. Tasmania. T- Tasmania with a Tasmania. What am I making up? I'm making up a word. <laughs> Tasmania? I don't know. It's- Tasmania, Ta- Tasmania with the Tasmanian <laughs> devil. I just made it up. It says it right here. Anyway, they head to Tasmania where they board a boat to travel to Melbourne, a.k.a. Melbourne, to rescue Kevin Garvey so he can resume his duties as the Messiah. This boat happens to be, just, just so happens to be, the venture for a massive lion-themed orgy. Those of you who are tuning in who didn't watch this episode, that's right. Don't clean your ears. I said lion-themed orgy. One of the guests is a former Olympic bronze medal decathlete who rose from the dead after breaking his neck three years ago and now believes that he is God. (laughs) If he looks familiar, that's because he appeared in the hallucinatory afterlife purgatory where Kevin went when he died and he came back from the dead. So this God guy with the red hat, he murders a guy by just simply tossing him overboard in the middle of this orgy party. And Matt is the only witness and no one really believes him. And uh, he also apparently is is dying. We've been talking about this, how we think he has cancer again. So Matt confronts this God guy twice. First, he gets punched in the gut. Ugh. Then uh, he, he gets mad and he decides to get an axe. And he knocks this guy out with the axe handle, holds him prisoner until half convinced he's got the real deal in his hands. Like there's this moment where he's like, Oh, I totally think you are God. Um, maybe he's just too delirious. He frees the deity in exchange for being saved from his illness. The cure doesn't seem to take. Literally, all the guy does is snap his fingers. And when the boat finally docks, police arrive to arrest this God character because they ended up finding a fishing boat found the floating corpse, which confirmed Matt's story. In all of this confusion, 
a splinter faction of the lion orgy frees the actual live lion brought on board as the guest of honor. Oh. The lion promptly kills and eats this god figure as he attempts to flee. Matt turns from the scene toward the camera, looks at his friends, and says, that's the guy I was telling you about. The end. Okay. That is absolutely bonkers. Like, I know when the, when the when the trailer came out and on the social media, on Facebook and Twitter, we said, like, oh, my God, this this trailer is bonkers. But th I, I literally have no words for what we just saw. And it's not a bad thing. It's just I, I, I never anticipated something like this ever. Like, no. Especially when there's so little. I, I keep using this term all season, but there's so little real estate to go around. And now we're having a lion sex cult party. <laughs> I am like, sad that I shared this on Facebook already. It's like, it's like, um, oh, uh, what's the eyes wide shut? It was eyes wide shut with lions <laughs> who talk, you know, like the lion didn't talk. No, <laughs> never mind. It, it was the joke from Harry Potter. Can't believe you didn't get that. Oh, you're a wizard, Harry. Yes. Unbelievable. Anyway, what did you? Rumble War. All right, well, let's just get this out of the way right away because I think this is kind of a hot button topic for a lot of people. Okay, I'm ready. The sex party. What did you think of the sex party? Was it necessary? Do you think it aided the story? Is it something that was useful to you? Um, or was it, or was it? I don't know if I would particularly it, say it was useful to me. Well, it could be useful to some people. You never know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, is it gratuitous like Game of Thrones, or is it even more gratuitous like it was in Westworld, or does it make sense? It made sense to me. Okay, I, okay so I'm like a sheltered person, in case you guys can't tell. I'm a little, like, goody two-shoes a little bit. <laughs> um, but we have seen different cults of people. We've seen very different reactions of people. We have heard uh, even Damon talk about how in times of crazy confusion and uh, earth shattering events that people like turn to different religions and create different cults. Mm -hmm. So um, I totally know that there are like underground people with fetishes and weird things. And I 100% was not surprised to see this okay. because it put a totally different spin on how, uh, people might be reacting to things and things that people might be celebrating. Is it something I would do? No. But do I believe <laughs> that there are probably um, orgy boats that go out? N not with a lion, but I totally believe there are. I was, however, constantly thinking, like, who is going to clean this darn boat? Oh, That's all I could think. Oh First, who decorated God. it? Oh. I wanted to know who decorated it because it was so pretty. <laughs> With all the little twinkle lights and like the little trees inside, I was like, "This would be a great boat to go on for like your senior prom." <laughs> but <laughs> I hope they more. didn't rent that out the next day because they need to swab the decks. Yeah, like what if you were just taking the ferry like the next day? You were like, "Oh, that's sticky." Like, "Oh, you know, <laughs> that would be just disgusting." That, oh my god! Whoa. How did you feel about it? You know, I worry about stuff like this especially with some um, of my favorite shows game of thrones being number one they have as of late they haven't used sex as much but in the, the first er, the early three seasons, seasons first three totally four did. seasons it was well overused and it never really benefited the story item number one it was the girl on girl when little finger is just talking and it keeps it's like a little finger monologue, and just we have this B roll going on of yeah, this girl. and they I agree. and it was like, okay, what that was are we gratuitous, doing? you know, and like, and then the same thing with Westworld. Like, okay, they have the big orgy in Westworld, but for what? Like, just because? Like, I, it, it, it was it was gratuitous, and trust me, I don't mind seeing sex. I'm zero prude, but I don't want it to be there just for the sake of being there. And this, I think, is when the leftovers, and uh, I hate to sound like a fanboy, but it, it, this is when it does everything better than anybody else. Okay. Like, you remember how we had the conversation, <laughs> well, we, we had the conversation last season about the rape scene with Meg and Tommy, yes. and we were like, okay, rape has been way overused, especially in shows like Outlander or Game of Thrones or whatever. Like, it was, it's been, 
it's been almost, overused. Yeah, they, it's almost like because you see it so much on TV, we worry that people can be desensitized. But but, but when they showed the rape happen with Meg and Tommy, it flipped its on it flipped it on its lid, and reversed the roles, and it, you know did it in you know uh, I think the term tasteful is probably a little absurd, but did it, it in the most tasteful way that it could to portray mm. rape. And this, to me... I would not use that word tasteful. Well, uh, Retract that statement. Okay, I will retract that then. Uh, it did it in the most economical. How's that sound? No. No. Uh, okay. and in a horrifying way, so that you you felt it. You felt totally horrified watching it. I mean... Right, okay. All right, all right. It was part of the story. That's what I'm getting at. It was. It was. It, there was a reason for it being there. It wasn't just the person's getting raped for the sake of being raped. This, to me, felt like it was um, part of the story and it was part of Matt's descent into where he had to go to discover where he ended up being. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have said Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, okay, fine, sure. You want to compare it to Sodom and Gomorrah? What is that? I forgot. Oh, my God. The Sodomites and they, they felt that the people in the Bible, this is what? like Old Testament stuff. Okay. They were like crazy sex fiends. My mom probably skipped people. this chapter of the Bible <laughs> with me. And uh, go, and the, the, the city was ruined. Uh, and who is Gamora? Oh my! You just let's just move. Past were they it. into it, the orgy or it, did they stop it? it? It just let's move past it. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to figure out. There's a lot of biblical references in the leftovers. What, Does this what matter? I'm, what I'm getting at, it, in my opinion, it doesn't necessarily matter. It what matters is Matt's. Uh, journey through it and it was necessary for Matt's journey because he had to be and you the viewer have to be put through the absurdity of the whole journey kind of like how we talked about the absurdity of Kevin Senior's journey yes it, this one too is also absurd totally and it tests him as a person it tests his faith it tests everything like he, he, he's, he's getting he's gonna get like handled here yes. by by an object yes. and they're like we're gonna take your seed bro you know what was really interesting was that he was through he was in all of this and yet michael john and Lori were just chilling out in their own little corner mm -hmm. michael was doing a crossword puzzle they were all just thinking it was hysterical slash this is every day mm -hmm. like i loved how Lori was like we're just gonna be at the bar and it's like Lori. <laughs> Do you know what's happened on that bar? <laughs> you don't, you don't want to be. You want to. You want to find Clorox wipes, okay? That's where you need to be. The no, cleaning you need, closet. You just need straight cans of bleach. That's just, it. Whoosh. That's it. Thank you so very much. I just found it really interesting that these other three people are in the same exact boat, are probably seeing the same exact things, and poor Matt. Poor Matt just he's just that unlucky friend that everything happens to. Mm -hmm. But he kind of he forces it himself. So all right. So before we I'm, before we go into the, uh, I feel like. The lion stuff. <laughs> the lion, by the way, is, is a real thing. The, yeah. That lion is a real lion. That actually happened. What they the, the story about how he was really old and then he impregnated all these lionesses. By the way, again, talking about a 90-year-old being getting pregnant. Yes. Okay. Just saying, Sarah. Okay. Yes, I'm just feeling. throwing that out there. Yep. Okay. Father Abraham and his sons. <laughs> and <sighs> What I what I okay, what I really liked about it is that Matt. W remember when they said you shouldn't say his name lest you become him after midnight. Yes, Matt became Frazier. He really did. And the reason why he did. I didn't get that. What do you mean he became Frazier? Well, I'll tell you why he became Frazier. And and yes, <laughs> fig literally he became Frazier kind of because they were gonna like I said, they had like the. The golden lion, which could be considered a golden calf. Just throwing that out there, too. That was in the Ten Commandments. Yes. I saw that movie. And people worshiping Frazier as another god, as a deity, worshiping this golden calf. They're going to use this golden calf to extract Matt's seed. Yes, there is a literal so translation there. Okay. But the figurative translation or the transition to Frazier is do you remember when he's talking to David Burton, who's played by Bill Camp? Yes. Uh, as Matt is talking to David Burton, when he's in the when David Burton is in the wheelchair, when he's in the wheelchair. Okay. As Matt gets angrier, the lion gets angrier, and it kind of takes Matt back a little bit. 
But then he gets empowered. And you heard it on, on what we played when Nat's saying, I did it for you. Mm-hmm. And the, the lion roars, and it didn't affect Matt whatsoever. And then when God, at the end of the episode, runs away, and Matt has kind of left his, his faith, like he realizes, oh, my God, everything I've done, I've done for me. I haven't done for God. It's all kind of crap. It's all kind of, it's all kind of bull. The lion cool. kills God. So you're like, saying – Like how Matt kills his faith. You're saying the lion is like a spirit animal. Damn straight. Okay. Damn straight. Okay. And And – I, I think, I mean, that's what it was there for, in my opinion, like what the line was there for. It was okay. there to represent Matt's journey, and it was there to represent what, what Matt ended up becoming, which is, in my opinion, faithless. Let's, let's get to the, the meat. Okay. Did Matt get cured? Um, I don't think it matters at this point. Did Matt, at the end, have no faith, or was his faith restored? No, I don't think it was restored at all because he – I think what happened with Matt is he looked at Lori and he looked at the futility of everything that he has gone through. And he has put faith in God and realized I, what I've done is – everything that I've done, I've done in the name of God, whether it was you know, um, help the GR mm-hmm. or uh, – uh, go to miracle and help my my family or i believe that kevin is the messiah it's all and he is vehemently passionate about his faith and then when he sees god die even though he he kind of believed it a little bit he, for a moment there he was like yeah i mean he let him out god. of his yeah. out of the ropes he set him free but then he you see him at the end of the episode it's gray um the camera is straight on and you see it's it's muted it's no longer vibrant the way that Nat usually is his face is his face is just emotionless yeah and he, what i see is zero passion he and he even his his job of finding kevin mm-hmm. remember when the cop says unless you have pressing mil- exactly. business in melbourne yeah. and he's like no I, that's I, I why don't. i think his faith is gone that comment where the where he act, said he doesn't have any pressing matters yeah and because of that because he doesn't have any pressing matters that means his it it's now his faith is now gone or he realized that his faith is absurd just like the journey that he has been on so here's a quick fun question mm-hmm. david burton let's say he did fall let's say he did die let's say he really came back to life just well, like he did he, no he did well we don't Listen, honey, you don't need to believe everybody. No, no. Okay? In, if, if you remember, in season two, in Off Ramp. Oh, okay. Yes, you're right. You're okay. right. Okay. They, they said that David Burton had died. Had died, and they found him, and he came back. But and, he was also in the hotel, and he was on the bridge. Right. And also, if you remember, the Pillar Man in yeah. episode one gave a letter, a letter to, to David Michael Burton. to David Burton. Okay, so for those so of you he, who are lost, okay, go ahead. David Burton – God in this episode wearing the red hat he showed up first as you said dirty santa was writing a letter to david burton david burton in melbourne australia and he gave it to michael to send off yes then we have when kevin goes to the hotel um or was it on the bridge i don't know if the hotel or the bridge before the hotel there was a there was a uh, a story that was on the news as meg was speaking in in the background uh, the story uh, in Off Ramp mm-hmm. was that this guy, David Burton, had died and come back. And then we can get to the hotel part. Okay. Oh, then then the hotel, um, when Kevin did karaoke, home, you know, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about. Uh, it, the MC was David Burton saying you have to sing. Right. And then when they were on the bridge and Kevin had the little girl, um, David Burton was there with the rope around his neck, saying you either have to cross or jump. Right, and he sa- and then he whispered something to Kevin, an international assassin, and we we still don't know what it was that he whispered, but that's what that's what made Kevin keep going. Yes, not and not jump. So lots of David Burton. David Burton has been around the town. So let's say he did die. He did come back mm-hmm. three years ago, which lines up with the same timetable as Kevin, and they've already met. When Kevin took the poison. Yes. Okay. In that, I forget what episode it was. Oh, I forget. 
But nonetheless, it goes to show you that magical things can also happen in Melbourne or in Perth, in Australia. It's right. not just miracle that miracles can happen in. And I'm wondering, does David Burton come alive after he's chewed up by the lion? Oh, that's a good question. That would be something that would prove that the guy is obviously special. But is that... But Kevin is special in the same way. They both meet in the hotel. Kevin yeah. dies and does come back. That's why I'm wondering if he's... I mean, maybe David Burton's done. But if David Burton truly had the same powers as Kevin, he needs to come back from this lion mm -hmm. attack. That's all I'm saying. And it's funny because a lot of people have been saying, especially Kevin himself, I'm not Jesus. I'm not God. But if you look at it, it's quite possible that he could be because David Burton is looking at it like, dude, I died and I came back. I am God. It would be reasonable for him to assume that he is. We, as the viewers, just don't believe it because we've been trained by Kevin to say, nope, something else is happening here. You know what I hated? How he took credit for everyone disappearing. Why did you hate that? Like, why did you hate, like, the... the even like the, the the absurd stories of like, nope, Jesus had a twin, and that's yeah. why everyone got confused. No, nope. and uh, sorry, it, it's kind of a lot. The to departure ask. is what pushed me over the edge, and I really wanted Matt to throw him in the cage with the lion, <laughs> because if that was true, you need to go away. That was not nice. Just because you can do it is not a good reason. Mm -hmm. And now, or you're lying, and that's not nice either. So I'm glad he got eaten by the lion. That's what I wanted to happen to him when he said he caused the departure. I'm not a nice person right now for saying that, and I don't take it back. David Burton should have been eaten by the lion, and I'm glad he was. <laughs> you know, and Damon has always said that, you know, 2% of the leftovers is supernatural. So there's room for 2% of this story. How do you say that word? Room? Room. Room. Not, not room. Room. There's two O's. <laughs> room. Room. <laughs> Fine. You know what? There you go. Okay. Are you happy? There's room for 2% of this story to be supernatural. So it would... I, are you willing to accept the fact that there is a supernatural la supernaturality yes. to David Burton? Yes. And that there is a possibility he may in fact be God. No. Because remember, we had that conversation during the Kevin Senior <laughs> episode. What is God? Who is God? What is the point of God? And if Kev if David Burton is God, God is just this person that is there watching things, and he just does things because he just feels like it. <sighs> and if that's the case, and if Matt were to believe him, you know, Matt believed that there is a purpose to all of this. Mm -hmm. And if God's just sitting back drinking beers like me right now. Sitting on a ferry. <laughs> and why is he friends with the captain? That captain should choose better friends. <laughs> Actually, reading a book by Louis L'Amour called Lonely on the Mountain. What is that about? Uh, it tells the story of the Sackett brothers. And the rare letters tell Sackett received always had trouble inside. And the terse note from his cousin Logan is no exception. Logan faces starvation or a hanging if Tell, uh, William Tell, can't drive a herd of cattle from Kansas to British Columbia before winter. I don't understand any of this. I, I know. To get to Logan, he must brave prairie fires, buffalo stampedes, and Sioux war parties. But worse trouble waits for a mysterious enemy shadow Sackett's every move across the Dakotas and the Canadian Rockies. Tell Sackett. Has never been abandoned another second in need. He will bring Logan aid to Logan or die trying. I don't think there's anything deep about that book, so I'm just going to skip well, it. it the, the, at least the title would suggest that David Burton, a, a.k.a. God, is lonely on the mountain. And that's why he's down in, in Earth. He is, he is lonely up there, and he's down here he's now. Just and he's just riding that boat. Things. And he's making the departure happen because... Because why not? Because he could. No. Because what the hell, right? He didn't think he was God before he died, and the departure happened seven years ago. Okay, you just thought you were some bro. Yes, no, I agree, but I'm so just you saying. You didn't make the departure happen. He is not God, and I am not taking that stance. <laughs> but maybe he has that that revelation that he is God, and it, it kind of like the Matrix. He gets downloaded. No, I'm. You know, he's not Kevin in Home Alone. I wish two percent of the world would disappear, and then he wakes up <laughs> in the R. No, no, you're not Kevin McAllister. 
You're just some guy that just got well, bronze let's, let's, Olympic let, Olympic medal. Let's let's be honest here. Uh, the the captain did say that David Burton was not his friend. He did say he's not my friend, but he is kind of famous. Okay. So you know. And he was also like, "Don't mess with him." Yeah, because you know he's God. And I like when the guy showed up and when Matt's in the bathroom after the after the blood. Yes, it's like so God punched him in the face, huh? And I thought that was like an Australian saying that yeah. anytime anyone has a bloody nose, they must say like, "Oh, God punched you in the face." It's like when um, <laughs> you know, when you have like an itch on your nose, someone says, "Oh, someone must be talking about you." Yes, yes. I thought that was like the Australian thing for bloody nose. But <laughs> it's not. But instead of itch, it's a punch. <laughs> God punched you in the nose. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh my god. Yeah, I uh oh, another thing. Matt is dying. It has been confirmed. Yes. Matt has his cancer back. Well, he's dying. He's well, not least, saying what it is, but well, he is dying. Yeah, and we can assume that it's the leukemia that he had as a boy. It has now come back. And he even asks David Burton in the conversation, then why is this why you're killing me? And David Burton neither says yes nor no. He gives a a, a slight like nod like, like yeah like a, a a barely noticeable nod so matt as we had asserted and uh, had our our theory which by the way you you did call so i'm gonna have to say this Bam! Just like that, a winner! he is in fact dying so great job my i probably shouldn't have like cheered myself for that <laughs> <laughs> I was like a winner, and I was like, "Yeah, oh, it's a yeah. bad thing." Oh, that's that's really bad, though. So, uh, oops. Oh well. So let's talk about the conversation between because or I feel like it's done. The conversation is done. Matt delved in, bore his heart out. The guy was like, "You've done it all for you. Mm -hmm. I am God. Let me go. I'm gonna snap my fingers, and uh, off you go." I was so nervous that. David was going to grab. See, I'm not calling him God because I don't think he is. Okay. That he was going to grab the axe and behead Matt and feed him to the lion. I knew the lion was going to eat somebody. <laughs> I just didn't know. Who, I at first, well, so I thought that's Chekhov's gun right there. You don't introduce a lion in the beginning part part of your episode and then not use let it. Let him eat something. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought that Matt might chop him up into little bit pieces and then he let him go. And I was like, man, David Burton's strong. Don't don't let him walk behind you. There's next there. So I was nervous about that. Right. And I love that moment, that that sudden moment. You could see it on Christopher Eccleston's face. Matt's face. Let's Matt's call face. them by okay, their character sorry. names. You, you could see it on Matt's face. And Eccleston, who plays Matt, is like a master at these at these facial expressions. Like from day one, Matt is a character that can easily be read. Because he is so vibrant and he is so passionate and he is so enthralled by the things that motivate him. But you have that one moment where he realizes maybe this is God. And, and he has now a moment to ask God, at least who he thinks is God, anything. It could be anything. And he asks about himself. He asks, is this why you're killing me? And it then, again, shows that Matt, yes, he is a faithful man. And, yes, he has gone to extreme lengths to get his hotel. Remember, he, he beat a guy to death nearly, you know, and, he, and yeah. he goes through the tunnel of crap and stuff in, in no room at the inn. I he forgot about that Brings walk. his wife, and he, and he keeps his wife prisoner in Jarden. The whole time until she finally leaves and even john's even john mentions this mm -hmm. maybe if you just listened to her mm -hmm. she wouldn't have left and you didn't treat her like a like a caged animal she would have left so matt is is capable of doing a lot of things and he needs vindication yep from god and god gives him no such thing in fact god snaps his fingers david burton david Blake, burton not calling him god well i'm just talking in terms of matt right now like yes. from matt's perspective this is potentially god and he has that moment on his face like oh my god <laughs> like literally like i am speaking to, to god and yeah it was that split second where he was like shame on you david burton you little fibber oh my gosh i'm so sorry god <laughs> 
um, I didn't mean it. I'm going to get down my knees. I'm going to do whatever you want. And what, what shakes him is the sudden departure thing. It's like, I did it because I could. And then he starts falling into this trap. Because that was like sort. the best uh, reasoning that we've ever heard. Yeah, because. <laughs> to be honest, I just why did would it. the departure happen? Just because some godlike figure could. Okay. Yeah. Oh, why oh, not? Okay. And that shows the meaningless, meaninglessness of God's acts and the how random it can be and how uncalculated it can be he you just stop referring to david as god so but i'm okay yes david is saying that it's potential that there is just complete randomness to everything in life and god who's potentially david or vice versa is just sits back and watches and when matt hears this that's when his life and the things he seeks vindication for have now been rendered have now been rendered meaningless and that's the scary part for matt and that is also why i feel like this episode although a little bit of a deflation from the momentum that we had from the previous episode is necessary because it now completes matt's character arc Matt went from a person who, who at the departure was uh, afraid and lost and someone who was blaming everybody else and, mm -hmm. and trying to poke holes into why this wasn't the rapture, yet he finds his faith. And then in the second season, he puts his faith in miracle and his faith is rewarded. Miracle. <laughs> I was just waiting. He puts his faith in miracle. This is the this is the height of what Matt is capable of doing. He is he has garnered a flock. He has people that love him, and he has people that follow every single word. This is the Matt at the height of his powers, and the final part of it in this episode is Matt losing his faith and losing the idea that maybe David Burton isn't necessarily God. Well, let's let's just go there. But he now knows the absurdity of what he has done, and he now knows the absurdity of God. It now opens his eyes to the idea that all of this is just kind of random. The show, man, it plays with your mind so freaking much. But you know who I loved in this episode who? so much? Lori. I was on the Lori train. <laughs> the Lori train of like, I'm just going to throw it out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here. I'm here for the ride. Let's go save Kevin. By the way, how do all these people have so much money that they can buy last minute tickets to Australia? Oh, they didn't. They went they on didn't. a chartered plane. Never mind. I take that back. Well, no, now. no. They went on a uh, oh, they went on the plane, but they paid twenty grand. Oh yeah. He, Matt, paid to twenty grand get to to his buddy, yes, who was caring for his not Matt's mother, but his buddy's mother. Matt's had twenty grand since season one. So again, this number twenty <laughs> grand keeps coming yes. back up. It's it's another connection here, which is really cool. So Lori just lays it down. You know, this is my ex-husband. I know all sorts of things about him, including that one of his tattoos is misspelled. And I wonder if Justin's actual tattoo is misspelled. That would be really cool. That would be it really were. fun. Um, and she's just there. And I love how cool John is. Like John's like, sure, you can come on this mission to like save your ex-husband, even though I believe he's Jesus and you've been having secret conversations with him about my dead daughter. And they still are smiling. They're still cool hanging out at the bar. Mm -hmm. They're still all cuddly. What an interesting relationship. I go back and forth where I'm like, man, are Lori and John relationship goals, hashtag relationship goals? Like, <laughs> you know, we can just get through anything. Kind of like how Nora and Kevin were. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that they have a lot of the same faults that Nora and Kevin did. They're not being honest. They've been hiding things from each other. Well, but but John even says, though, like, I, I would have hid that from me, yeah. too. But John didn't tell Lori, Lori about the book. No, he didn't. You're right. That That's true. That's true. So, so I, I will give you that. But I like that they've come to peace with it, how it's just kind of like, oh, maybe she'll be an apostle, too. We're going to hang out. We got to see in a preview that she pretty much says, like, I'm on board. We're going to try this uh, out. Uh, uh, you can't, they can't go what? into spoilers. Please, uh, what? Pre previews are spoilers, and some people don't want to hear that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So well, I whatever. don't know what she's talking about. She might be saying she's on board to eat mac and cheese. <laughs> but just we'll just say that she's sure, she likes she's mac, eating and, mac cheese. and cheese. Why not? So is it the elbow kind or the shell kind? Shell. Is it Velveeta or is it Kraft? Neither. It's Annie's. <laughs> I'm a Velveeta guy. I love Ugh. the thick cheese. Oh, I hate that. Anyway, so I was a big fan of Lori. Um, 
just loved how she, Michael, and John were just so chill in this episode. I love that nobody's answering the phones. I don't know if that's because the phones are kind of down mm -hmm. because of everything that's been going on. Um, yeah, this this boat was a wild trip, man. And I like the fact that Lori is there to propose to Matt that <laughs> Kevin is having a psychotic break. And guess what? You're following a guy that's having a psychotic break. And what does that mean about you? That potentially means you are freaking delusional as hell, just as much as he is. And this episode teeters back and forth again on faith versus versus logic. Mm -hmm. And that is what Lori is there for. And that is what she succeeds at extraordinarily well. And that is why in the end, when I look at this episode, and, and I can see why people get frustrated by it. I can see why people are like, bro, what are we doing with sex parties and a whole episode dedicated to Matt and, you know, seeing lions and God. And it matters because it's talking about what is faith and yeah. what is sad delusion you can't so much about this show mm -hmm. is faith and what people do based upon faith and you can't have a season a series finale season without an episode dedicated to someone whose faith is completely broken mm -hmm. i think so i'm i'm is matt my favorite character no no he's, he's not. not i just i don't love him out of everybody. But I'd this is say. why but I think it worked better than the Kevin Senior episode. Yes. Because I at least have more investment. I, I have more investment and I have more attachment to mm -hmm. Matt than I did more Kevin history. Senior. More history. There you and go. I've seen his journey. I've seen him go from one way. I, I've seen him begin one way mm -hmm. and end in an entirely different way. Yep. And knowing that he has he has this mission of trying to find Kevin and bring him back. Mm -hmm. to Jarden. I mean, the idea of Matt getting to Australia and then bringing it back to Jar bringing him back to Jarden, uh, Kevin, that is, Please before, <laughs> before, you notice how I've been saying Jarden so you wouldn't sing the Miracle theme song. Uh, it, it is in and of itself just as absurd yeah. as a lion sex cult. It is. It's a crazy notion, and yet these these peeps are on board, and they're somehow going to find Kevin, hopefully, with no cell phone. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> let's let's get to your sudden theory. Well, of the well, week. No, 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 no. Yeah. Actually, I I also wanted to talk about the opening. What did you think about <laughs> the opening? Oh my gosh. And and naked yoga. Oh. And toe the, strength. And and toe strength and things going flopping like Kevin Garvey. Like I, you know, I'll tell you this. I was really glad. He was not flopping like Kevin Garvey. First off. <laughs> no, oh. I was just glad it wasn't a uh, female. <laughs> yes. Uh, for any females who have streaked in their youth, <laughs> there's extra flopping because there's two flops. So um, <laughs> Mary did. OK, for those of you who are wondering, yes, Mary did streak in college. Every, it's like a passage that you do at URI. You, <laughs> you streak the quad. Um, nonetheless, that, that's what I was thinking in that scene. I wasn't actually looking at anything nude about this man. I was just like, wow, I'm glad they have a female. I mean, not, not, they don't have a female character because this would be really awkward. Um, you know, I didn't even care that he was naked. I don't okay. know why he was naked. I was like, is there something with, like, clothes? At first, I thought he was going to take the other guy's clothes. And yep. that's why he was naked. I don't know why he had to be naked aside from the fact that clothing would prohibit his flexibility. Oh, that's a good one. Because think about it, like your suits and stuff, like your really kind of tailored stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're really trying to do a nice like stretch, I'm trying to do it right now. If you're doing a little split, you get that tension in your crotch. And even okay? in your shirt too, like you have yes. something. Yeah, okay. So and I he think, was reaching. And I think to, you know, he didn't have Lula Row. He didn't have like flexible <laughs> yoga pants. Okay, he was on his submarine, so he had to get down to the bare bones so he could be Mr. Flexible. And I have really strong toes. I like to do tricks with my toes sometimes, pick things up from the floor, like popcorn that I drop. Or um, binkies. Or binkies, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so from one strong-toed person to another, I was like, way to go, man, way to go. I liked it. I really didn't care that he was naked aside. Like, I think he needed to be naked. Right. I really do. I think had he been in his uniform, it would have prohibited. He would have gotten so far. It would have been an absolute fail. It would be like 
ninety percent. <laughs> no, it would be like ninety eight percent. Yeah, yeah. He wouldn't be able to grab with his like his his big toe. No, he, he could get his fingers, but not the big toe. There you go. So that's why, in my opinion, that is why he had to be in the buff. So ultimately, I really appreciate this episode, even though I give it a four point four. I do appreciate what it's trying to do. It is trying to tell you faith versus logic, and it is trying to tell you. You can put your faith in things. It just depends on what your faith is and what the end game is. If you really believe that, you know, one thing is going to happen, guess what? Just because you believe it, it may not happen. It may not. And your faith may be just as meaningless as everything else. And what does this do to Matt, the character? What does this do to... What does it do to me? Right. What does this do to him going forward and how he approaches Kevin and how he approaches his life? And, and granted, he's probably not going to have much more life after this anyway. Well, let's, let's. Well, no, 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 no. And the reason why I'm bringing all this up again is because as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of the question that I posed to Damon and Tom during our interview with them in just recently, in I think it was episode 40 where I asked them, do you consider yourself a man of faith or science? And Damon, in the middle of my question, and Tom both started laughing. Mm -hmm. And I have the sound here. I'll play it. Do you guys consider yourselves men of science or men of faith? (laughs) And which do you think is most prevalent in the leftovers? Yeah, uh I, I feel like the most honest answer to your question is I I am a man of science, but I feel much better when I'm a man of faith. And so I'm constantly trying to move uh, move towards that pole. Um, but the gravity of science is much more powerful to me than the gravity of faith. Um, that said, science kind of bums me out. Um, <laughs> And I'm much more, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, it, if you basically like look at the world through, through the lens of, oh, oh my God, everything is going to shit. Um, that's not really a good way to lead your life, but the science does seem to support that more than everything's going to be okay. Uh, and, uh, I want to spend more time and everything's going to be okay. And I don't think it's necessarily about faith in uh, in a deity uh, or a, a or a religious system, it's it's more sort of magical thinking. I mean, I guess I would say to you, you know, I'm a I'm a sports fan as well, and and I'm uh, I'm a jet I'm a New York Jets fan, mm-hmm. and so I I have and I know that I'm not alone in this. Um, like, I will actually sometimes feel like when I'm watching a Jets game that if I turn off the television uh, or switch channels, that the Jets will do better. And the narcissism uh, and ego involved in that thinking that I have some impact in my living room mm-hmm. over what how the Jets are going to fare is so ridiculously uh, shameful. But I do it anyway. I still do it. Um, and that seems – I don't have the power to not do it, even though I know scientifically that turning off the television has no consequence whatsoever in the outcome of the game. But it makes me feel better to not be watching, which tells me that I, I am in, I, I am trying to basically move into that um, into that faith category where I can sort of will slash pray the Jets into a just to, just get to the playoffs, guys. <laughs> like you can be uh, the wild card. I will settle for at this point. But- so first of all, Damon, if you're listening, what I didn't say to you at the time was. You're a Jets fan, and like our listener before him was a Falcons fan, mm-hmm. uh, like for him, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're a Jets fan. I just want to sing West Side Story. When you're a Jet, you're a Jet. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, I hear this, and I think he was tipping his hand a little bit Tell about me. Matt and Tell about me. what this season was going to be about. It's absurd that he turns his TV off, just like me. I admitted in that interview, I turned the TV off in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I shaved my beard in the middle of halftime. I changed my jersey because I thought, I'm going to change the outcome. 
and the narcissism involved <laughs> in that. And that you could change the Super Bowl. The you, faith, this guy in Rhode Island. Right, the faith that it takes to do that. It's, it's absurd. It's shameful, like Damon said. And look at Matt. He thinks he is changing the outcome of things that are happening. Like, he thinks, I have the ability to make things happen. I'm doing all of this for God. I'm me. I'm changing the channel in service of the Patriots. Yes. Damon changes the TV in service of the Jets. I move to Miracle and I bring my wife there because I'm doing something. And we don't know. We don't. It's it's totally 100 percent absurd. Yet we still do it. We still look at it like I, I can have an effect. And that is what I think is happening to Matt now. He sees the absurdity in changing the channel. Yeah. So uh, and and he sees the absurdity in in his faith in what is meaninglessness and what is meaningful. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that is what ultimately it's all about. And Damon is the one who tipped his hat. Uh. So let's get to the listener feedback. What, oh, do you think about what about that? your sudden theory of the week? Well, now that comes at the end of the show. Oh, so well, you had it in the Google Notes. I know. Early. I know. Okay, ready here. Okay, that's for me. Okay. I messed that up. Okay, listener feedback. Hold on. Oh. You didn't have music in the notes either. (laughs) I follow the notes to a T in case you didn't notice about me. All right, now you can get into it. (laughs) Clint Church gave it five Damon. Stunning and brilliant. This episode deals with theodicy. Theodicy? I don't know how to say it. Sure. Sure, there we go. The question (laughs) of why a good God would allow suffering, uh, which has been Matt's question all along. Mm. And I think it's many people's question. Matt finally gets what he's wanted for so long, a conversation with God. He gets to ask God why, but God turns the question back on Matt. Why did you abandon your family? What did you do to sacrifice your happiness for others? Why does there have to be a reason for everything? Have Matt's labors been self-righteous all along? When he prayed to God as a boy, did God save him? Did David Burton save him again with a snap? Matt tells Lori he is dying even after his talk with God. He has lost his faith in God after his conversation. That's the guy I was telling you about, he said. Well, I think this statement extends beyond the guy who threw a man overboard. This is the guy Matt's been preaching about all his life. This is the sum of his life's work. That was the God he's been telling everyone about. And now that God is dead. I really like that ending, too, when... When God is dead, God in, in quotes, you know, David, David Burton, Burton, Matt turns around and says, this is the guy I was telling you about. Like this whole entire time. Yes. This was the guy I was telling you about this whole time, not just on the boat, but his entire life. And look how absurd this is. The guy dies because he's eaten by a descendant of a sex kitten, Frasier. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like how absurd, right? Yes, it is absurd. Greg Cuoco on uh, on Cuoco. Facebook says uh, 4.85 Damon. Look at that exact number. I know. He's even more exact than I am. Truly a masterpiece. This episode explores the faith of Matt and through its crazy religious metaphors really ends up with Matt as Job actually getting to ask God why. Why Matt has sacrificed yeah. everything for him and he is still being punished. I am so bad about knowing my Bible. <laughs> you went to Bible camp. How do you not know this? You literally went to Bible camp. I remember the songs. Oh my God. <laughs> Our God is an awesome God. He reigns <laughs> from heaven above with what, wisdom. Yeah, I got what, it. What we find out if that God <laughs> is fairly indifferent and does things just because I can. After all, God is the authority, and although Matt thinks he is watching, judging, he actually is not. God retorts, you have not done anything for me. You did everything for yourself. Yeah, we keep calling him God. He's not God, I think. I think he's just David Burton. Like with Job, no explanation. God does not need to explain why he caused the sudden departure, or anything else for that matter. In the end, Matt finds true peace within himself. Even if this is not really God, when he refers to, that's the guy I was telling you about, I think he was talking about God, capital G, okay. who he has been preaching about his whole life. And, you know, just as a personal note, uh-huh. I've always had trouble with faith. I've always had trouble with 
and I suppose this is my story and how I relate to this episode. We didn't do that at the oh, beginning of the didn't. episode. We I need to have the little Max Richter music underneath. Oh, crap. I Just don't pull have it up. It. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> whatever. Don't worry about it. Uh, I've always had trouble with my faith. Um, I've always had trouble with God. I've always had trouble with religion as it's been proposed to us. Even and, and it was even it was exacerbated by the fact that I went to Catholic school. And when I asked the teacher a lot of the times or at, at you know CCD or whatever, I'd say, why does God let why does God permit people to suffer? Why does God do X, Y, and Z? Why did God bring down the walls of Babylon? Why did all this stuff happen? Why did the Holocaust happen? And I always got the same answer. Which was? And I didn't like the answer. I always thought it was a cop out, which was God doesn't need a reason. Oh. And I always felt that was a catch all. That was like, that was somebody who couldn't explain away why certain things happened. And the answer that they could find was I don't have to give it to you because God doesn't need it. God's superior. God has this. God has that. God can do anything he wants because he just freaking wants to. And that to me is full of it. That's what David Burton said. And that to me, if. I, I, I can get it. David Burton should have been a CCD teacher. But David Burton at least gave you a reason. He said, because I could. That, to me, makes sense. But God saying, I don't need a reason, that that just, oh, my God, it gets me so freaking mad. I, I, oh. I can tell. How about I read the next one? Louisville <laughs> yes, Dad please. tweeted that he gave this episode 3.5 Damons, elaborate setup for a minimal yield. Interesting but underwhelming. And Santiago... Vilaba said the ACN reference plus that ending a thousand daemons. What is ACN? ACN for all of those who were wondering was the network that they were showing the explosion and the missile rise yes. in the background. Yes. And ACN is the company that was part of um, the show, the newsroom with, uh, with uh, Jeff Daniels. Okay. I was on HBO. And uh, that was the network that was on there. So it's a, it's a cool inside HBO joke for those uh, who watched the newsroom. Okay. Sarah Dossett, I think that's God. Everyone has tried to reason with Matt and get him to come back to reality. I mean, Mary and his child left him. They didn't do it. I mean, Lori is pretty good at convincing people, and she couldn't even get through to him. It took that whole situation with the supposed God to help him come to terms with what's happening to him. Victoria McGarrell gave it five demons. I think this was my favorite of the season so far, says Victoria. I especially love the Garden of Eden turned purgatory imagery. We're reviewing Matt's personal hell. And depending on how you interpreted the lion killing uh, God or Satan, Matt was either liberated from his faith or it was emboldened. Either way, he's about to get crazier. <laughs> the most interesting thing for Victoria was to watch this season I was how much more insane Matt seems than Kevin. Matt being someone extremely faithful to his religion to the point that he's nuts compared to Kevin, who's probably, let's be real, clinically insane, ultimately acts more level-headed about the world they are living but in. But is Kevin really insane? Is he really insane? Because we see David Burton. David Burton is a real person. David Burton was in the hotel. That was not just a manifestation of Kevin's psyche. Although... If you really wanted to go like grassy knoll give over it, here, give it to okay, me. If you really wanted to go grassy knoll, Kevin may have seen the news report. Actually, he did see the news report about David Burton. And maybe there was a picture of David Burton in the news report. And then maybe his psyche translated that picture. His subconscious okay. took that picture, put it on David Burton, uh, on the character's face. And then we have David Burton, the character who is now God. Listen, I. That's all grassy knoll, though. I'm not feeling the God thing. I'm feeling that David Burton might have the same special powers as Kevin. I don't think either of them are God. I, I don't think either of them are crazy either. I think I no. think this confirms the fact that Kevin is not crazy. That the, the hotel did exist. It happened. And. David Burton, who we are seeing in front of our face, was there. Justine Coe says, besides, besides feeling very dirty and greasy after that cruise, boy, I don't know who to trust. Kind of buying into this madness and not trusting Lori. Oh, do you trust Lori about all this? Do you feel like uh, she's leading Matt down the wrong path? I'm cool with Lori. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that Lori's there. You know, she's pretty chill. She's pretty even-headed. Knows to hang out at the bar on the boat and um, is keeping Matt a little <laughs> bit in line. When when Matt gave out the beans about Evie. Oh, my God. I was like, oh, my God. And that's how you knew the episode was good. Because you're sitting there like, what the hell is John going to do? And 
even Matt talking about Lori's whistle. Remember, she was blowing the yes. whistle at him in season one. And when she was a member of the Guilty Remnant. They were both getting, like, seeing Matt and Lori play off of each other. Like, they don't have a lot of scenes together in any of the episodes of The Leftovers. And now we finally have Amy Brenneman and Christopher Eccleston going at each other. And they were just, when she was talking about Nora, she's like, you have a sister that's there. You haven't even checked on her, have you? It just shows you, again, how, how intense Matt is. But the two of them, when, <laughs> when she says, yeah, and Kevin shits four times a day. Like, just, again, proving Watch that he's not. Watch your language. We're on Facebook Live. This, I, I'm quoting. I'm quoting. I'm not saying it myself. I can't get in trouble for quoting. Um, it just shows, again, that they are great. And I was just, oh, man, I was so pleased. From Missy, she says, uh, we've had three different Matt episodes, but they're all similar because they all deal with Matt's faith. In season one's two boats and a helicopter, he tries to save his church. In season two, no room at the end, he tries to get Mary back in to Miracle. And now season three, <laughs> he tries to get Australia to every time, every time. He tries to get Australia, get, to get to Australia to bring Kevin home to, to prevent the apocalypse. There are always things slash people trying to stop him from succeeding. And he always seems to find loopholes. This time he has accepted his fate. And I thought the opening sequence with the sonar pangs and the French dialogue from the ship was really intense and eerie. I would agree. It was very eerie. It reminded me a lot of the Desmond, yes, from Lost. We have to go back, Kate. Also, the explosion happened in the South Pacific, like possibly where the island was, too. I know. I couldn't handle in it. In Lost. I was I just can't. We have to go back, Kate. Mind blown, Missy. Great job. And uh, finally, I really love this David Berg character. I always have. He has been introduced to us here and there throughout the seasons, and I knew he would be significant. I feel like David Burton was actually Dean, or he sent Dean to Kevin. I feel like he also could have been the Patty that Kevin saw, or at least Burton made him see. He's been alongside Kevin ever since the departure. Mm. He's either the devil, or he really is their modern age god. I think the voices that Kevin Sr. hears are sent from Burton. Ew. In the episode, I Live Here Now, Burton tells Kevin that he needs to be more original. He says everyone always tells him that they want to go back. And on the bridge, he tells them this is more real than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. The last time we saw Burton, he was at the hotel and Kevin was, in quotations, dead. So now that we are seeing him again... Is Matt dead too? And everyone else on that boat? Are they all dead? Oh, no. Matt didn't believe him after he snapped his fingers, but he did it first. And I think Matt knows that Burton is evil. Also, I feel that Kevin is Jesus's twin. He may not be Jesus, but he is definitely his twin. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, hmm. I'm I just really good, Missy. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You brought it on that one. What is the tweet of the week? We haven't had a tweet in the week in quite some time. I'm so excited. So I'm proud to present the tweet of the week. The tweet of the week is brought to you by Ty Avenger, and she says, Not since the opening of Die Hard 2 have we seen the start of a show with naked yoga hashtag naked yoga hashtag the leftovers wow and uh you know <laughs> just thank you because you made a first of all you made a die hard 2 reference and i awesome and of course die hard number one being the greatest christmas movie that's ever been made no it's not yeah 100 well, okay for those of you watching live right now, what is the greatest Christmas movie ever made? Because clearly it is Die Hard, okay? And for those of you listening to the podcast later on, please let us know in email or Facebook what you think. Smoggy Misunderstood Genius. Yes. What do you think is the greatest Christmas movie ever made? Um, maybe a three-way tie between Elf, No, 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 you got to make a choice. No, 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 no. you got to make a choice. Make like, a choice. if it's the Elf. Oh, no, not even close. <laughs> What's your favorite color? Not even. <laughs> <laughs> The four not, major food groups. <laughs> not even candy, candy corn. <laughs> candy canes. 
oh, syrup. All right. all right, you ready for my sudden theory of the week? Um, just so you know, there's a Kevin in Home Alone. Uh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Thank you, Missy. <laughs> you ready for the sudden theory? Yes. All right, let's do it. All right, did you have one? Yes, we're going to see dogs. <laughs> I'm that, still sticking to my dog. That thing. is. I'm still sticking to it. We're going to see a dog. That is a massive cop out. No, it's not. Oh, that's a total cop out. I totally disagree. And I hope that dogs play a major role just to shove it. <laughs> For me, you know, I'm going to do a cop out as well because I've realized. Yeah. Now that we've had the, the lion sex cult. Yep. I have zero freaking idea where this show is going. I have no idea. I. Oh, okay. I, I can't. I can't even pretend to know. I, like, there's there's not even – I can't. I just – I can't. So what I'm going to say, my cop-out yep. sun, sun theory of the week Bring it. is that Matt is going to die. Matt is going to die. Because now that they've introduced it, it's going to happen. No kidding. Of course. Great job. <laughs> That's like a merry sudden theory of the yes, week. Yes, it is. Because there, if anybody – I don't care who you are. If anybody <laughs> has – the, has the the, the narcissism <laughs> other than the writers to say I know what's going to happen in the leftover season three. I challenge you really to tell me where you think it's going to go. I'd love to know as well. I would love to know. Call call us on the hotline five zero three four five four six seven three zero. Let us know on Facebook. Tell us on an email. I don't care. But I I challenge you, the listener. No, but I actually don't want to know. I want to be enjoying it. Well, you know what I mean. Okay, you know I mean. let's close out the show. Oh, sorry, wrong one. Oh crap! I I played the wrong sound. Please hang up and try again. All right, final thoughts, my darling. What do you got? Three episodes. The countdown. Oh, the final man. countdown. Da -da -da. <laughs> da -da -da -da. It's coming, guys. It's coming for you quick. Yes, it is. I, I think, you know. Uh... Okay, so we're here. <laughs> we're here, guys. We're all still here, okay? And you still are, too. Let's do this together. Let's bring it on down. Let's show our creators our love. Okay, find these, like, little obscure people who are the writers and tweet them and tell them you love them. Tell them that you love this show. I think for, for me, the final thought is I, I like – the Nora episode, I was a little frustrated where it was going at first, uh, but then I, I saw the purpose and I, okay. and I understood where we're going. And my one criticism is, is that the show better get its act in gear. Like we only have three episodes left. Get its act in gear. Where do you, where have you been? No, no, no. I'm not saying that it isn't in gear already, but I just don't want an episode like, like I want this kind of an episode will not be next week. That's next what I'm saying. Next week is going to be all oh man. I want to make sure that every episode going forward carries the momentum down. Like we are, we are falling down the, the I think we're going to see dead people. Really? Yeah. It, Sixth it, sense. It, are, it, is this uh there's my sudden theory. I think we're going to see dead people. What kind of dead people are we going to see? I don't know. Like, I'd like a Meg. I've been wanting a Meg. I would love to see Evie again. What I'd, if we see Patty again? Yeah, I'd love to see Patty. I would just love to go back to the hotel and see all sorts of dead people. I really want to go back to the hotel. Let's bad. do it. Let's do it. Let's kill Kevin Jr. again. <laughs> kill him till he's dead. No. <laughs> no, he's gonna come back. He's gonna come back. And and I would oh man, seeing seeing Meg would be fantastic. I would love for her to I know we said this in, in like the first episode. I would just love for her to see him screw with Kevin. Like bad in, in the hotel. And I would love to see although if they brought Patty back, I feel like that would that might be a, a little disingenuous because they yeah. handled Patty. Yeah. Patty's done. Let's get some Meg or Evie. Oh, Meg would be great. It would. All right, you ready to close out the show? Yes. All right, let's do it. So that just about does it, guys. We're social people. We want you to join in on this. So if you're listening to this in your podcast app, feel free to hang out with us on Facebook Live every Monday after the show at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can find us on Twitter. We have, the handle is Living Reminders and also on Facebook. 
by just searching the living reminders or by using the handle. Or if you reminders. want to send us a long message because you either love us or hate oh. us. And I really want you to either hate us or love us because that means we are el eliciting a good emotion. Send us an email at livingreminders at gmail.com. That's right. And if you think that we provide a good enough value for you in your leftovers experience, or if you like the things that Mary and I do in Mary and Blake Media with all the shows and podcasts and blogs that we have, please visit patreon.com slash tallmommedia. Again, that's patreon.com slash tallmommedia. And uh, consider donating a dollar or two or $120 billion or, hey, even in the leftovers mode, 20000 You hey, never know. You okay. never know. Uh, we would appreciate it. Uh, it helps keep our production going. It helps keep our show going. It helps keep everything that we do here going. And we would be honored. Can you please say going one more going, time? Going, 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 and gone. Uh, and we, we, we'd be... Ooh, there you go. I ugh. got you. You see, you got me all messed I up. Now. I was on a roll, and you messed with me. Just just stop going. I got you. All right. We would be honored if you if you help keep our production going. How's that go. sound? Until next time, ladies and gents, I'm Mary Larson. My name's Blake. And we're still here. All right, Facebook. Facebook Live. We're still here, and we so are, are here. you. Thank you guys so incredibly much for tuning in. This episode will be up in the relatively short time I'd say by tomorrow the next, afternoon. I would say within the next hour. Never we'll mind, be up within iTunes. the next hour. Fun fact for those of you who've been tuning in: um, these, uh, I'm, I'm also doing like makeup now. That's right, I'm doing makeup. So <laughs> if you find, uh, if you search for my like professional page, Mary Larson. Um, I'm going to type it in, Mary Larson, here in Facebook. Um, you'll see links, but I'm doing makeup tutorials. So for any of you ladies out there, for any of you guys who want to even dabble or tell your friends who are ladies to dabble, sharing different little fun tips, but it's just another thing that we're doing as an income source um, to help for the family. So a little fun fact for you there. So is the beer still there, or what beer is it? It is Kentucky Bourbon Barrel Ale. Yes, it is. Because we had a Kentucky Derby party. Um, so thank you guys so incredibly much for tuning in. I'm going to go relieve the sitta. Yes. This has been a blast. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for the love. Keep telling your friends. The leftovers rocks my socks. <laughs> I hope we didn't offend too many people tonight. We could have. People who I like saw a bunch of my friends who probably don't watch the leftovers were joining the Facebook live. And I was like, oh, my God, they're going to come in when it's like flying <laughs> orgy or like you know another inappropriate flopping. word like that yeah flopping <laughs> goodness gracious so uh, i love you guys because we can talk about this and we all know what we're talking about we're, we're in a safe place we're in a safe place and i probably shouldn't have shared this on my own personal <laughs> facebook wall that's why i don't share it on my personal facebook wall i might have to go take it down <laughs> <sighs> all right guys much love thank you so much for joining us and uh having fun with us so see you hook? next see you next week where's my hook oh it's not there <laughs>